and welcome um, to our very last talk um, of this year's festival. Yes, this is their surveillance state. Um, I'm here today with artists and theorists to discuss the politics of the personal image in a world where our actions are being increasingly monitored. This is an evening on exploring and questioning how art interpolates and interrogates the surveillance state and how it asks its audience to challenge a data-driven future, their own fears, biases, and views which are impacted by the technological world around us. We'll examine how these artists with me this evening came to their creative practices and the timeliness of this very discussion. And um, yes, like Claire says, I'll be feeding your questions through after um, each of the artists this evening have presented. Um, so joining me this evening is Alfonso de Gregorio, um, an artist globally recognized cyber security technologist, a featured speaker and a hacker. His chief artistic concerns are to raise questions about the world and the time that we live in and to make politics sensible and accessible. In his practice, Alfonso examines the aesthetics and politics of surveillance, traumatic memory and sustainability. He works above all with the media of image making, informatics, lecture and engineering, sitting at the intersection of art and documentary. Also with me this evening, oh, and sorry, just to add, Alfonso has been one of the exhibiting artists at this year's Belfast Photo Festival. And also with me this evening is Esther Hovers, an artist based in The Hague in the Netherlands. Esther investigates how power, politics and control are exercised through urban planning and the use of public space. She was trained as a photographer, but creates installations in which photographs, drawings, text and film play an equal part. Esther's work has also been featured in publications such as the New York Times and the Washington Post, Le Monde and Wired. Also with me this evening is Adam Brimberg, an artist, activist and educator. He currently works and lives in Berlin and is a professor of photography in Hamburg and teaches at the MA Photography and Society program in The Hague. For two decades, he was one of the critically acclaimed artists duo Brimberg and Shannon, and his work has been in major collections in the Tate, MoMA, Yale, Cleveland Museum of Art and Baltimore Museum of Art. So this evening, each of these three artists with me, welcome, are going to present 10, 10 minutes of their presentations of their work um, that examines the surveillance state. First up is going to be Alfonso. Um, so Alfonso, can you please take it away? Thank you so much, Anna, and hi, everyone. I will share my screen and let's get started. Anna, would you please confirm you can see my share screen? Yes. Thank you, fantastic. So uh, thank you for the invitation to speak about the surveillance state and the permanence of, of our not so private data. And thank you for the opportunity to exhibit at the Belfast Photo Festival 2021, my latest body of work, Retain Reports. I would like to start by offering you to ponder a few of the thousand questions photography can raise about the subject matter we are all concerned about. When asymmetries of knowledge between citizen and the surveillance capitalist translate in asymmetries of power, what will be the consequences for democracy? When we lose our private realm, how do we assert our moral autonomy? When predictions of our future behaviors are enabled by knowledge and end up with control, what control do we retain over, over our lives if companies know more about us than we know about ourselves or that we know about them? Or ultimately, when all our future behaviors are predicted, what does it mean to be human? Very long story short, I'm a cybersecurity technologist by background who has now turned visual artist and big career. I've been working 20 plus years in, with, with the industry, government, and academia in shaping the discussion and practice of cybersecurity. Now, in the post 9 11 world, information security has increasingly become relevant to the national security of our countries. Intelligence gathering is of essence to achieve any meaningful notion of national security. And one of the most effective methods to collect intelligence is to build a surveillance apparatus. 
But as you may have probably heard by now, surveillance is not only in the hands of government organizations action with ensuring the security of nation states. In the post.com bubble, surveillance is the business model of internet companies. And in the latest and most pernicious embodiment of capitalism, internet companies claim our private human experience as free raw material. Surveillance capitalism gathers and fashions our behavioral surplus or data exhaust into prediction products which are sold in behavioral future markets. In all likelihood, this, this is the most accurate sociological characterization of the world and time we live in and was offered by Harvard professor Shoshana Zudo. So in my professional career, I gained, I gained a deep domain knowledge about our interconnected possibility space and the resulting societal risks. Now that I approach the arts as a way to distill my thoughts, the societal challenges related to my professional career form one of the main thematic areas for my group. In retained reports, my latest body work, I question our problematic relationship with data originated from our private human experience and invite us to imagine an alternative economic and social logic. To do so, I turn the surveillance capitalism and means of production against itself. I train a generative adversarial network, a particular AI algorithm using unsupervised machine learning to hallucinate the portraits of imaginary individuals based on an analysis of the images found in the public domain archive of Kostik Aksinte, one of Romania's most prolific early 20th century photographers. So before getting to my imagery, let me show you a sample of Aksinte archive. Many of of these fragile glass plates have sustained damages over the years due to heat or moisture. The delicate silver gelatin emulsion has peeled off and the, and the glass has cracked or splintered. Worked down by the time and elements, the portraits in the Axinta photographic archive are to me allegories of the impermanence of human artifacts. Their counterparts in retained report though are like personal data in the ends of the surveillance industrial complex, permanent artifacts of computational processes and a visual antithesis. It's very hard for citizens to delete all their data, even though they may resolve and stop sharing them. So let me try to elaborate further the reason why the portraits in written reports are visual antithesis. I present these portraits as images retained on an electronic ink screen. This is a chosen lieu of traditional archival photo paper. You may be all reminded about what an antiphrasis is. An antiphrasis is a rhetorical device which uses words or phrases to convey the opposite sense of the real meaning. So if, for example, I say in a tongue in cheek, you are such a funny guy, I'm using an antiphrasis. And visual antiphrasis do something similar with images. Now, in written reports, the aesthetics of impermanence of, of accinta portraits is reinvented to speak about the permanence of our behavioral surplus. Consider this, electronic in screen retained for years or even decades, the contents impressed on their display, even after getting unplugged from their power sources. I hear with me on video, one of such screen I've programmed in December 2020, and which remains imprinted one semester after getting unplugged from its power source. So in a way, electronic screens reinforce the questions raised in written report because they make visible how data, including private and personal data, can become permanent. I hear you on this. You are saying, how about the right to be forgotten then? Well, there's neither sufficient transparency nor effective oversight about the operation of companies we daily entrust our data upon. IT operations replicate data for all kinds of purposes, ranging from the need to provide high availability, redundancy, load balancing, fault tolerance, content distribution, and so on and so forth. So we quickly lose track of the multiple copies we leave around of our data. Furthermore, our data result in prediction products which are sold in behavioral future markets. We are left with the very unappealing need to believe the capitalist, if this was ever an option to you. 
So I'm reminded about an observation by A.L. Weisman in interview with Adam Bloomberg and Oliver Chanerin while speaking about 3D face recognition technology and forensic anthropology. This is published by Mac in Spirit is a Bone. Uh, A.L.'s uh, remark, photography obviously, obviously still record not only the subjects that are aimed at, but narrates the history of the science and technology that allow such images to be created and disseminated. There is never enough time. Thanks for yours. I think I will stop here. Thank you so much, Alfonso. Thank you so much, Hannah. And next in the program, we have Esther Hovers, who is going to present from here. Thank you. Hi, and thanks, Alfonso. Also, that was really interesting. Um, I'm going to share my screen also. Um, there I go. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. Um, yeah, my interest in surveillance kind of actually comes out in my interest in photography in public space. Um, and like you said, I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about how control sort of shows itself in public space, whether that is through architecture, urban planning or surveillance. Um, and I'm going to show you three projects I did, not all, everything I did, but just a bit zoom in on these three projects that have a clearer link to these themes. Um, and the first one is, is false positives. Um, and that's a project I did a couple of years ago, which is uh, a series of uh, photographic scenes in, in Brussels. Um, and for this work, I interviewed um, some people that uh, worked on intelligent surveillance camera systems in, in, for airports in the Netherlands as well as Belgium. Um, and they kept on speaking about anomalies in body language and movement. So which were actually very standard kind of uh, things we all do, like standing still, uh, running, clusters breaking apart, synchronized movements. Um, and I based this work on all these, on eight sort of uh, basic anomalies. And these anomalies uh, very much have to do with the contrast between uh, individuals and majority. Um, and so I've created these street scenes in Brussels where you can sort of seek out an anomaly but I've deliberately kept it quite vague as to what you are, what, what kind of deviant behavior you are looking at. I'm really more interested in thinking about the gray area and sort of questioning who comes up with uh, what is then deemed normative behavior. Um, yeah, just show you a couple more images. So I made these all on a tripod with a fixed frame and uh, or fixed composition and I would wait for people to pass and then ultimately I layered uh, the images so everybody in the image was there but not necessarily at the same time which also allowed me to go into the scene and, and talk to people and make them aware that I was photographing them and um, but also sort of a uh, gives me an opportunity to look at a longer moment in a single image. Mm. And this is how I would present it or an example of how I presented it. And that brings me to another project called The Traveling Salesman. This is a body of work I made in New York um, for which I, I made a series of um, of places in Manhattan, which I try to figure out the fastest route based on the idea of the traveling salesman problem, which is a mathematical problem uh, or 
question about efficiency of movement in public space. And you can compare it to the idea of Google Maps and sort of trying to, to always figure out the, the quickest way to get somewhere. Um, and then I photographed an actor walking between these different points. Um, and I mainly focused on sort of actually just photographing life and the city around him, using the city as, as sort of the city and the light uh, as this sort of metaphor for the unpredictable. Um, I'm interested in sort of this sense of control of efficiency within the city and then, then the unpredictability of the city itself. Um, this is also part of it. Yeah, I like to just show a lot of images rather than, <laughs> than only talk. Um, and this is the most recent work I made, which is uh, called the, uh, the Right to be Forgotten. And it is about the right to be forgotten, which is a, a European law about a data removal um, of or private information to be removed from search engines. Um, and I focused on the first really well-known case um, of this man. It's a little hard to see here. This is a layered image. Um, and I, what I did for this series is I, I took the portrait of the first man to ever claim his right to be forgotten in European court. And I took that portrait as a starting point to reproduce. And I deliberately looked at uh, photographic reproduction methods that simultaneously show and alter uh, the work somewhat. So making it quite ambiguous who we, ambiguous who we are looking at. Um, for example, this is a, is a dark room print that, um, that is unfixed. So it'll, it'll slowly uh, go darker over time. And this is a drawing, pixel drawing, pencil because um, I wanted to incorporate this element of time. And I think ultimately what combines the works is that I'm interested in, in the need that people have to control. Um, and I think with technology, it's only becoming more apparent, but I'm, I'm generally interested in sort of creating work that questions this need for people to control, whether it's through public space or digital space that is kind of this new public space almost so yes that's it <laughs> i will stop sharing <laughs> thank you so much esther um that was super interesting it was also really fascinating to see where your work and Alfonso's work kind of parallels each other, but also diverges on its themes. So thank you both so much. Um, and now I'm going to pass over to Adam Brunberg. Unmute. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hi. I'm just green. Um, this is a kind of ironic way to talk about surveillance. Uh, with 22 people in my bedroom. Um, anyway, thanks for the invitation. It got me thinking a lot because um, I know that the work you uh, probably invited me to show, which I should, let me just show it before I start talking too much. Uh, so share screen. But what I was thinking is how dated the work is, even though it's only five years old. It's, uh, let's start with This that. is Yekaterina Samutsevich, a member of Pussy Riot. This portrait was created by a machine. A facial recognition system recently developed in Moscow for public security and border control surveillance. 
This image was made without her knowledge, consent or cooperation. This technology was designed for surveillance, but it was also created to photograph people who would normally resist being photographed. In 1925, photographer August Sander created a project which presented an exhaustive portrait of German society. 491 portraits, from the banker to the baker, the revolutionary to the poet. This epic task took him over 30 years. Brumbeck and Chenerin co-opted this technology. They used it to construct an archive of contemporary Russia of the same scale. They produced the same exhaustive archive in under three days. These images are low resolution and fragmented. Their success is determined only by how precisely the machine can identify us. So uh, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go into this too long. But you're familiar with August Sanders, kind of um, citizens of the 20th century, was it? And um, you know, he did the banker, the baker, the whatever, the artist, the artist way. So as you heard in that, we cast in the matter of three days um, all of those uh, so-called kind of professions or casts, and we. So this this was in I need to say this this is in 2014 or something, and we came across this what what at the time felt like this kind of horrific new technology which had two tiny cameras that could be placed on each side of any door and you walk through the door without even pausing, and it would create a 3D map of your face, and. Uh, somehow, uh, Ori and I got access to this place. We cast each um, each of the people that August Sander, you know, the banker, the baker. This is what you what can, I can't see there, but um, we we basically did all of his character, all of his characters. But uh, you know, we did it in two days, like like you said in that video. And if you look at this. I mean, it was quite, at the time, it was really horrifying to look at this technology and think that, you know, the people who are running the, um, let me just close this and talk to you like a human. The people who are running this company said, like, if there was a protest that was going up Oxford Street, um, and there were these cameras which are, were would be in every uh, light, you know, like kind of, or, or you know, all the way up the street, and somebody's face was partly obscured in the first one, it would piece it together by a puzzle so that when you reach the top of the street, it had put the puzzle together. <clears throat> now this is like uh, what I was saying to Anna, we had a chat last night, and I said, it's so funny how dated this technology seems and how nefarious and, and toxic it felt like even five years ago. Um, and I think that's really a key point here is that we did, you know, we did get access to this thing. We did reveal it before it had been rolled out, but it's now, I mean, also given COVID, it's become kind of, you know, like Naomi Klein's, um, what was it? The shock factor or something, you know, how states use this kind of state of exception to implement more repressive regimes. And obviously the whole of China is, um, every person is catalogued in this way. I don't know if any of you have kind of gone through European or American airports or most airports now, and there's a series of doors that uh, you go through and they seem totally ridiculous. It's like you go through one and then you kind of pause by this little thing and then you go through another one. And that's what they're doing here is they, they're creating a 3D map of you. And I think what's, what frightened me the most was the notion of um, 
Let me just stop sharing for a minute, I think. What, uh, what frightened me the most was this notion of like, uh, you know, the work of Alphonse Bertillon from the 19th century who kind of cataloged criminals according to kind of physiognomic characteristics and uh, in the hope that they could predict who had a criminal cranium or a criminal nose or, you know, so to prevent crime before it happened. And it feels very much like that's what this project is about. And I think both metaphorically, philosophically, and logistically, it's like we are we are criminals waiting to commit a crime, as opposed to uh, this technology being used to protect us. It's being used to predict our behavior. And as we know, uh, so many of the algorithms are so uh, so biased and so slanted that, uh, you know, if you're going to predict criminal behavior from that, we're in real trouble. But as I say, I think most of it's really dated. Um, and there's a few points I want to make, which is, uh, I think, first of all, we need to recognize that photography has always been about surveillance since its inception. So it's 300 years since the moment it was born, it was born for surveillance. And it was mostly colonial states that would send out people who would photograph, you know, uh, the French photographed Palestine and showed it as an empty landscape right for, like as a frontier for colonization. Um, but there's endless books, as we all know, of like people cataloged and typed, right? So I come from South Africa and there are hundreds of albums of Zulu woman, Koza woman, uh, you know. And so, and there's also that kind of mythology of people resisting being photographed because, oh, I don't, you don't, don't steal my soul. That was actually like, it's total bullshit. It's uh, the only thing I learned in three years in sociology in, in the eighties in South Africa was, was that people were aware of how photography was being used to police control and catalog them. And their refusal was an act of resistance. But I just want to say that this is, you know, surveillance and photography are, have such a, and state control, like that's, that, that's the, the three kind of little um, holy spirit or whatever. Um, and then somebody said something, uh, Alfonso, I really liked your thing because what I'm really interested in is co-opting nefarious technologies and using them for kind of radical purposes. So I was thinking recently, I've been doing all, all this work in kind of blockchain stuff. And I was saying, you know, every mobile phone, I don't know where um, my kids got mine, but you know, we've got face recognition and it's such a toxic thing. But if we use, if we used it in a clever way, then the person being photographed would be recognized and built into a contract. So you wouldn't have the sense of abuse because photography is all about this kind of one way flow of power, whether it's a photograph taken by us or a photograph taken by the state that's hidden up in, in somewhere. Um, and just, uh, how am I doing with time? Couple, one more minute. Um, I also think uh, it's interesting, like, you know, having a boomer here, because uh, when I think back to kind of films that I grew up with, like Francis Ford Cop Coppola's um, The Conversation, which is such a brilliant, uh, portrayal of surveillance and the kind of paranoia that it, that it brings up. And I've got to say, I've got like a really, because I'm a boomer and I, I, I didn't grow up with social media or understand it as a, as a professional tool. I've always had this kind of quite toxic, odd relationship with it. But uh, my way of dealing with it is to reveal everything. So I remember like, you know, on my Facebook page, putting, how are you today? And I said, I've got genital herpes. And so I think this idea for me is, if I reveal everything, literally everything, then I am no longer either a consumer or a product for social media, because 
I have nothing to hide. And I feel like, I don't know if that makes sense to you. It's almost like if, if I just reveal as toxic as I am and not try and be an acceptable member of society, then nobody has a hold over me and I'm not marketable and I'm not purchasable. Um, and I think that's important. And I think finally, I just want to end with one thing. Um, and thanks Alfonso to bring up um, Eyal Weizmann's text, but Eyal and I and, and Oli uh, have worked for many years together. And when Eyal looked at that body of work we did called Spirit is a Bone, he said, you do realize you are creating an archive and even though you're creating an archive with a progressive kind of uh, intention, archives are slippery and in the wrong hands they can be used for, the, for, for, for nefarious or like for bad purposes. So um, I'm just trying to think what else. I think that's really something that's um, important to think about when we create work. Uh, and I'll just say like my last little story is you, 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 most of you will know Susan Mercedes and her remarkable book on Kurdistan. And I was once at a conference in Cairo and Susan was presenting that work. And I, at the end I said, has this archive, have you ever had regrets about this? And she looked at me and she was like, oh, fuck you, Adam. And she said, yes. And, and she, she was, she, she, she kind of turned like white. And she said, in 2003, when the Bush administration were arguing for invasion of Iraq, um, they used that book, her book on Kurdistan, as proof or evidence of Saddam Hussein's abuse of Iraqi citizens. And she was like, you know, can you imagine somebody who spent 10 years building something so progressive and it within 17 seconds is like co-opted. So I think the final thing I just want to end with is how can we, and this is my mission always, is how can we take technology that's built by, you know, always the kind of, uh, the military industrial complex really, and how can we co-opt it and use it to undermine their, their um, to undermine their, their goals and their aims. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking currently very much about Israel and Palestine and uh, maybe we can get to that. But thank you. I think I've used up more than my time. So I'm sorry about that. Thank you so much, Adam. That was really wonderful. And I think um, has dredged up a lot of what we can talk about in this next um, portion of the webinar. Um, so thank you, Esther, and thank you, Alfonso, also. Um, everyone watching, um, you can definitely field questions in um, the Q&A portion, um, and we are going to continue just with a little conversation in the meantime. Um, but I think um, that's actually a really great place um, for us for to start on. Um, is what you touched on there, Adam, and what Alfonso was talking about um, in his initial presentation, the co-option of these practices and technologies for radical purposes. And um, I wonder also with Esther, um, as you are initially a photographer, and that is your first creative practice, you're you know, working in a practice that is about visual data capturing and surveillance in a way and how you interact with that practice, um, which is also about interrogating um, as well. So I wonder who would like to jump in there first. Maybe maybe it is you, Esther. You're muted. I'm mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> um, wow. Uh... Yeah, I, I didn't like get a single like one specific question from that, but um, yeah, I think it's also, I come from it to it from a different perspective. You say like, it's my first medium is, is visual art. And uh, 
I really try to make work from this place of not knowing. So, I mean, sometimes when I'm asked also to talk about these topics because I've made these projects and people approach it as if I'm now also kind of an expert on these themes, I really don't think so. But I think there is a power in sort of actually using the not knowing. And I think art is a great place to ask questions. So I actually really try to work from um, from this place and and it's for me I also don't think that art is that my work needs to be necessarily didactic or that it's really my job but um, I do like to play a bit with this part of of maybe the I think you we talked about it before also that art is a great way to democratize also and and I think in the sense that Mm, as we try to sort of broaden this discussion that not everybody is going to read up on these themes um, by going through all these academic papers but I hope that my work can sort of like just be really like um, an easy place to start yeah to do maybe just question some things and yeah <laughs> wonderful um, Alfonso I suppose put that question to you also and coming to you with your background in cyber technology and to and then diverging into art. Yeah, I'm a concert technologist turned visual artist. Mm -hmm. uh, my artistic practice is informing both its form and content by my professional background in cybersecurity. Um, the subject matter I typically deal with in my professional life escapes the visible. So in it, in my artistic practice, I do my best to problematize and aestheticize, which is to say to make it sensible, perceivable to our senses, what has remained invisible so far. Um, and this is where technology, science and art meet. Uh, they diverge though in the vocabulary I use. Vi visual languages are not a good fit to articulate complex arguments in the same way we do with philosophy or mathematics but they can shine if we utilize them to raise questions, as Esther already noted, uh, about the world and time we live in. Um, Adam, I wonder um, also how you, you um, mentioned there briefly um, Palestine and Israel, and I know that you um, have some uh, Palestinian um, artists and activists taking over your Instagram account and, um, I suppose that is an example of um, co-opting um, a social platform to um, interrogate um, that political and social space right now. So I wonder um, if that is something you could share with us. Oh, you're muted. Mute. Uh, that's been, yeah, it's been an underest, like, I'd be understating it to say it's been an interesting month. Um, I have this kind of, I'm a strange minestrone of like uh, Holocaust surviving family, first generation Eastern European arrived in South Africa, apartheid activist, anti-apartheid activist then, uh, but I have a sister and her family in Israel. And so there's not so many darts you can throw at me, right? Um, and I woke up, but not not even thinking about this, I woke up one morning and I I just posted something really from the heart, which is that my little nephew was called up into the special forces and was in the tunnels between Gaza and Israel. And my niece had had a one week old baby and she was kind of going up and down into the bunker, you know, and I was, you know, I was really worried about them as anyone would, but I qualified it and I said that I know that both in terms of the kind of psychological trauma and the physical existential threat, it's not a thousandth of what anyone in Gaza is, is going through. And I just put that down and then I had one of those moments where uh, Jerry Saltz reposted that thing while I was sleeping and I woke up and to like an Instagram account that had 10,000 more followers and 10 and a thousand. I was getting like people sending me stuff 
you know, I, I, I had to become a kind of broadcast station for a while. And, um, but uh, what was so interesting was the shadow banning because Instagram is run by uh, outspoken Zionist um, supporter. And uh, it was, there were, you know, it was very clear that I was, they were attempting to close me down. And it's just been really interesting to, and then a lot of my, uh, I guess my, more recent practice has been research based, which is to look at who does control the narrative of these technologies or who controls the narrative of the art world, right? Um, and, and living in Germany is really interesting because if I would be seen, there's a law in Germany that says if you vocally or clearly support the boycott and divestment uh, campaign against uh, Israel, that's tantamount to being an uh, anti-Semite and you face legal prosecution and jail time. Um, so, which I find really odd, you know, Germany is sending money and arms to a nuclear power. And in my opinion, they're taking out their guilt for what, for the Holocaust on Palestinian children. And it's, but I, I I'm not going to just turn this into a rant. What, what I'm going to say is it's been a very delicate thing in terms of, uh, and I've been coached by many people, uh, of how to deal with this Instagram account so it doesn't get closed down. And, and how to use it as an asset to investigate kind of propagandas from both sides. And you know what I mean? So it's been, it's been really interesting for me. Um, um, to use it as a platform as opposed to a kind of uh, personal, you know, personal promotional tool. Um, but I don't know if that answers your questions. I think one of the things I just want to say, like, uh, uh, you know, is, and I need to say this about the art world, because when it comes to there's a lot of trendy practice around uh, surveillance technology. You know, there really is. Um, I mean, we could all name five or six or seven people who are making, you know, from Hito Steyal to uh, there's many people who are dealing with the stuff and in a very thorough and brilliant way. Um, but what's amazing is how um, there's a kind of censorship around certain issues and Israel and Palestine is just a no-go. And, um, and I find that, uh, I find that a, a, a kind of surveillance and control of another form, mm -hmm. um, you know? So I'm sorry to turn this into my current obsession, but I think it's quite important to mention. And mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, all of this technology comes out of either Russia, which is just a fucking cowboy assassination plot, or it comes out of libertarian Peter Thiel, um, you know, morality, which is, uh, it's all libertarian, it's just hor like horrific. So anyway, I'll stop. You know, not at all. It, it's it's very interesting. I think definitely uh, a pertinent discussion point. I'd seen myself um, that Snapchat was being used by um, people in Gaza because Snapchat has the feature where um, you can zone in on any location in the world and it can show you um, the geotags. And if you click on the Gaza Strip, it could show you um, wow. people Snapchatting in real time. And at the time, um, I think this was just before the kind of you know, the world news that's on the BBC homepage, um, you know, before it gets that worldwide attention, you can get that immediate um, dialogue with um, Palestinians on the ground using yeah. Snapchat in that way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like you said as well, shadow banning is a huge issue and um, there it's towing the fine line between how to co-opt these technologies for radical purposes um, without getting completely shut down. Um, 
I wonder if we can talk a little bit more about how surroundings and local politics, social landscapes kind of influence all of your work, because I know Esther, um, we spoke uh, previously about some of the work that you've done in Brussels and um, Brussels is obviously, um, you know, an, a, a city that's um, um, of politics and um, that represents um, a lot of um, interesting themes um, around surveillance and the and state control. Yeah, I, I think though, because you, you asked me also before to think about um, how my surroundings influence my work, mm -hmm. but I think mostly I'm influenced by, by my age and like my generation and because I'm from 91, 91 mm -hmm. and um, it's really this growing up with technology that that really just, and what I said of this not understanding that really makes me want to pursue these topics. I think also it's um, like when I was about seven years old, I had my first website and I, my dad would help me scan my drawings and I would put them up like a little studio. And um, I, I mean, obviously I took down the website a long time ago, but, um, but I think it's, it, you can find it like, and that for me, it's so strange that it's like floating around and sort of just trying to sort of take these themes and they're so abstract to, to make something physical out of it is really interesting to me. So I think I'm mostly, mostly influenced by that. Um, but in, in Brussels, yeah, I think I, I like to, to use Brussels in my work as a symbolic meaning of like a de facto capital of the European, of Europe. And uh, yeah, but it's, it's more this, my age, I think that influenced me most, yeah. Mm. Um, and how, Alfonso, would you also respond to that? Yeah, of course, the industry I come from is certainly highly influential for my practice. It revolves and thrives around gathering intelligence about a wide range of actors and for a broad range of purposes. While the government is interested in creating political, diplomatic, military, economic, financial advantages, the internet companies are interested in denying us all notions of privacy to monetize our private human experience. Hence, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's not in their best interest to, to raise questions, but this is something artists can do. And because in 20 plus years of professional life, I gain a fairly good understanding of how things work, I feel both the responsibility and the obligation towards the civil society to frame the societal challenges related to the surveillance state from my very peculiar vantage point. Um, it, it's interesting, yeah, what you say about um, responsibility. Um, and I suppose that um, is something each um, artist has to personally question um, within themselves. Um, and I wonder how you all kind of approach the art that you make and how what you think about what the spectator um, should be doing or how you would like to see um, someone responds. How do you make someone and how do you make wider society question their own biases and fears and relationships with this um, technology and surveillance? Um, if anyone wants to take that question. Um, uh, yeah, maybe like, I'd like to like broaden the definition just of surveillance and technology. Cause I think, like I said, it's a little bit of a dated thing. Cause I think it's so embedded in our daily, you know, I mean, it's on my phone. It's like, there are 50 devices in this house and I, I like, I'm, I'm not a tech person. That's right. But uh, I think there's a particular language around this thing, which is either it's like the Chinese model, which is the state just imposes this regimen and everybody's got to put a barcode onto, you know, it's like everyone's registered or 
it's kind of sold to you. So like, you know, Apple come up with that little thing and do you look like an artwork or whatever it is. Um, but I think, uh, I think th there's, the problem is, is that who, who's controlled and who's built these things essentially. And it's, you know, we might as well be in the 17th century, honestly, like I've spent the last year examining the kind of blockchain cryptocurrency uh, NFT world, which has all these promises of like decentralized economies and no gatekeepers. And, but in fact, you know, if you look at the demographics, it's 85% heteronormative white men who are wealthy in cryptocurrency and it's toxic. And what's so depressing is that with all this technology, um, including surveillance technology, we have the ability, you know, like imagine what you could do for medicine, like medical thing, if everybody had was recognized and, you know, and you could kind of read, I don't know, you understand if, if, if there were benevolent forces behind this thing, instead of like control, right? Because I do believe in, in, in state control. I do believe in us as a society. I'm not, I'm not, you know, so, and I think the last thing is just to enter into these worlds as a kind of counterinsurgent. I think that's something Ollie and I learned to do really well. And it's something I still do, which is like enter it, learn it, understand the population, understand the language, and then fuck with them, right? like betray them so badly that it kind of undermines their like it's like oh you know because it's like don't tell me it's decentralized what you mean is it's deregulated and don't tell me it's you know uh so and the depiction of women and it's just like it's like honestly and then they've got these kind of these digital lands called the metaverse which look like 17th century Trinidad and Tobago or something like ready to colonize and you don't like luckily you don't have to kill the indigenous population you've just got to like burn a whole lot of um carbon footprint but anyway I could go on for ages but I think uh I think getting inside and learning it and then like doing a kind of burrows cut up even you know is interesting mm. um it's yeah it's interesting what you bring up there about the biases in algorithms if i remember right um a little while ago there was a big study in the us about the kind of rampant racism in um decision making software used in american hospitals that was affecting millions of black people um, because of its the racial biases in healthcare algorithms. Um, and I do think we need to be, you know, constantly asking questions about, you know, who is making these algorithms and, you know, what purpose they serve. Um, and uh, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Just one more thing is I've got a nephew who's one of these, uh, he's honestly one of these uh, Elon Musk types. He's like, he's got an E, IQ of like 7,000 and an EQ of like a dead rat. And um, he's a brilliant like programmer, right? Six years of like unbelievable like training. And he's, he's genius. He's absolutely genius. But I asked him in the four or five years of, of training, how many lectures did they have in ethics? And he said, not one minute. Now, if you think about like you study medicine, I mean, you do that once a week, right? And you have to sign uh, an oath at the end in order to practice. And I think, I think this is what it's all about. It's about regulation and who's in power. Al Alfonso, I wonder if you could respond to that um, and how that kind of. Um interpolates in your own work and also just to add again you know what you're thinking about when you think of the spectator who is viewing your work and what you want to evoke um within them well, sure i was listening to adam uh, in, with his reference to the different models of surveillance um 
the more state control in China or the libertarian in, in Silicon Valley and the various uh, private public partnerships that exist, exist across the globe. And I was wondering what's the common, the, what's the Firouge, the, uh, what's the common ground? And a common belief is that technology equals surveillance. And modern day technology is a, a, both appealing and deceiving enough that most people will accept it as it is. I want this to change in a way. I want art to invite viewers to imagine alternative futures where, where we, we will have rethought the rules and the power relationships. It's not just wishful thinking. I'm old enough to remember when in the 1990s, the techno-scientific community was designing technologies to be smart, sure, but to be smart in a privacy preserving way. So all of which is to say that indeed we don't have to leave with total surveillance. The technical possibility, the possibility space exists for building privacy into our technology. But simply we need to align the incentives because nowadays the incentives in the marketplace are completely misaligned, distorted, and effectual. And it's not in the best interest of the players to uh, provide greater security for the users in their products. Mm. And, and Esther, how would you invite viewers to um, challenge and think um, when they've viewed your work? Mm, yeah, I think I touched on upon that a bit before already. Um, yeah, just really trying to sort of much more raise questions. Like for the false positive works, I I really try to to stay away from sort of creating something that is very uh, like sensational or I think a lot of the time we speak about this kind of this kind of algorithm as something that is so uh, yeah still in in media we talk about it as, as something that is uh, this big data and we have no control over it and it's sure we 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 talk about the fact that there's uh, the biases of people that created the algorithm, but I really wanted to um, to sort of just talk about it in a non-sensational way and try to use um, the biases of the viewer or trigger those to look at the work. And um, wow, there have been so many points, but uh, yeah, I think also it speaks to to a much bigger problem than saying that biases in algorithms are in creation of algorithms are the problem. It's it's that biases are the problem and are the bigger problem. So I think uh, we need to address that on a much much bigger scale before, we, um, yeah, before we can even address that in in technology. Yeah. Yeah, we need to get white men out of power. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no. Starting with this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I have a question here from um a viewer um Seba um who is asking um where is surveillance going from here and what for you is the future of surveillance and also where does it end if if it ends. I think not. I think it's, I don't think we can predict that. But I think, um, I think it was interesting also that Adam started talking about uh, Bertillon and about this tradition in photography of surveillance. And, but even before that, even before photography, there was like the panopticon. There has been surveillance before photography. So I think, um, maybe it's pessimistic but i think people people somehow have this 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 will to control um yeah i don't think art can can give an answer to where that will lead in the future but yeah hopefully like i said i i hope we can i think it's you cannot like um think of alternatives to a system if you don't understand the system. So I think uh, a lot of it, yeah, art can help maybe with that. 
sort of like questioning the system. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think the idea of staying the avant-garde, you know, it's easy to slip behind where technology is. And I think it's our, it's our duty to stay informed and to understand how it works and where it comes from, and then to be able to manipulate it and to turn the camera back. You know, essentially it's like the male gaze, right? I mean, that's the most toxic of surveillance. And it's, it's been with us for three centuries, well, been with us since fucking Adam and Eve. So it's like, uh, how do we invert that? And that's where I think um, it's not about, I think surveillance is with us forever and has been, but it's about how we, how we, how we co-opt it is the best way of putting it. It's like, mm. it's, it's like hijacking, you know? Mm. And, and also like um, Esther mentioned earlier about um, democratizing um, the discourse around um, technology and opening up that dialogue um, with um, a wider mm. public and a wider um, make audience. It, make it more inclusive. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, the, the lack of diversity and inclusivity in it is, is radical. And I think that's something that's it's quite easy to, um, but it's something that needs to be addressed. Mm. But also that kind of suits the art world, you know, the kind of, um, I don't think the art world's a very progressive place to be playing in personally. Mm. You, know, I think, um, you know, I think like, A.L. Weissman's forensic architecture is such an interesting kind of hybrid now where he brings in artists, he brings in, you know, technologists, he bring, well, not him, they all collaborate, but it's like it's such a, such a beautiful example of people who philosophically, technologically um, are at the cutting edge of thinking about this stuff and, and know how to use it. And they use it against those people who have historically used it as evidence against us. Um, Alfonso, I wonder how you would respond to this question also about the future um, of surveillance and um, if you'd also um, not see the end. Well, it really depends upon us. We have the institution and the bodies were to rediscuss the surveillance state. Uh, what is lacking is a at a certain extent, awareness uh, about the risks posed the surveillance state on um, the civil uh, society. Um, uh, we shall ask ourselves, is art up to the task to sensibilize and democratize uh, the debate of surveillance? Uh, well, I can tell you that in this moment in history, we are advancing, we are, as a society, I mean, uh, we are advancing technology faster than our ability to keep up from a, both a policymaking perspective and from a cultural discourse perspective. So we need in the art world uh, novel strategies in order to remain relevant in a way, in order to, to be on the forefront of the public debate. Uh, in my art practice, um, what I try to do is to retain some, uh, some degree some domain knowledge about the subject matter we are concerned about. This is why my background, I think, provides a peculiar vantage point. Uh, hopefully, we'll, I will be working more on that. Mm. Um, Adam, something um, you brought up there um, previously was uh, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, and that's something I've actually been thinking about a lot recently. And um, the disaster capitalism and how, I mean, this discussion that we're having right now is so timely um, as it kind of speaks to the world that we are in, how amid a pandemic public space has been impacted, how we connect with each other and use these technologies is forever changed and civil liberties and human rights have been greatly impacted in this time under the guise of um, political and social emergency. So, um, I wonder um, if this is something that we can discuss yet and something that Adam, you've um, also 
um, really rightfully um, mentioned is the kind of, yeah, the timeliness. Um, and despite, you know, uh, projects that can outdate, you know, um, they're still worthy of analysis and still something that we can impose on the time that we're living in right now. I guess, yeah, absolutely, you're totally right. I, I, I guess it's firstly, it's it's very subjective. I mean, uh, you talk about surveillance, none of us are living in Gaza, um, you know, and that's the ultimate surveyed, uh, you know, enclosed society. And the other thing is, so it's, it's you know, I think our, our suffering of surveillance is, is, is a subjective thing. But then I also think um, what you're saying is it's how much do you, how much do you have to lose is my question. Uh, and this is a big question because I remember going into the Zobladovich space in 1998, I think it opened and I, I, I went to see two people I respect immensely, Mark Titchener, who's an artist who deals with the aesthetics of power. And um, what's his name, the BBC documentary guy who does the kind of like fast edit. Yeah, like, come on, you know, uh, he's, he makes those kind of documentaries of like the fast edits and then uh, No? No, you're gone blank. Uh, and he, it's all about kind of surveillance and state and power. And his name is uh, uh, Curtis. Uh, Adam Curtis. Yes. Yes. Well done. So there was a talk between Adam Curtis and Mark Tichner, and we're sitting in the Zobladovich space, which everybody knows is funded by Israeli arms dealing money. And I was like, what the fuck? And the point is, it's how much do you have to lose? And I think, you know, if you live in Gaza, you've got nothing to lose because life could not be worse. Uh, and if you are Anish Kapoor, you've got, I don't know what you've got to lose, but evidently a lot because he hasn't opened his mouth, you know, about intersectional solidarity, which is, you know, so what I'm trying to say is, I think, we can be as effective as we are courageous and our courage is linked to how much we have to lose. And I think if we feel beholden to an art world that is run by a particular perspective, or we are beholden to the state that has, you know, I mean, we've got fucking Boris Johnson in government and like, what are we talking about here? And Priti Patel, the, like we're having this kind of sweet conversation about the role of art in, we're living in a fascist society. So like, you know, uh, it's like, it's like, come on, you know, it's like, I don't know. What, what, what are we talking about? Our, our, our art careers? Or are we talking about like radical change? I don't know. And that depends on what you have to lose. And I think the less you have to lose and the less beholden you are to institutions like the art world, which is the most toxic um, on the planet, then, then you can really push the boat out and you can have an effect. Mm. You know? Absolutely. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. To apologise, um, Alfonso. I, I wonder if, th if that's something that you would like to respond to. Oh well, uh, Adam was so eloquent. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing I can add more. Than that. <laughs> um, Esther, um, I was also thinking, um, in that sense, because your work, um, so investigates the use of public space and how that has kind of. Um, changed across the pandemic? Has it made you approach your work differently or question um, question things a bit differently? Mm. No, not really. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think uh, it's interesting to hear also Adam talk about the, the art world like this. Mm -hmm. obviously I'm like starting out much more so I think also this 
this pause in a way has also made me made me think about um, yeah how to how to how to approach that because I think um, yeah. I don't know. It's a lot to think about. No, <laughs> Just uh, uh, yeah, being uh, a, being a starting artist, you I think you think about it differently also. But if in all honesty, like in all honesty, I think um, I think I try to these really really big topics we think about, huh? And I try to look at them in a my on a micro level. So I, um, for me, it's going to, to help friends out, friends without status. Um, yeah, it's more like I try to do these things in my neighborhood and not through my art, personally. I think art for me is also, yeah, it's to question things. And, and I admire so much the work of people who can put all of that into their art. But I think if I put all of that as an ambition on my art i don't know if i will make work i think uh yeah i try to do that on a micro level and from art art can be about beauty for me as well yeah and that might even help a little bit <laughs> um yeah i mean it, these like huge questions can be so paralyzing um i think and if we were to let those all wash over us at one time um I agree. Nothing. <laughs> and also, Esther, I, I thank you for saying that because, you know, if you don't get the ABCs of activism right, which is like being, being a human being, but, you know, to, the, to your fellow human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's the ABCs and we're talking about the X, Y, and Zs, you know. So I really, I really appreciate what you're saying. Thanks. And, uh, I appreciate it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I think we we actually have to end it there. Um, but I think that's a, a hopeful um, note to end things on here. Um, thank you so much um, to Esther and Alfonso and Adam for your time um, and for presenting your work. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening in this very last iteration of uh, this year's festival. Um, thank you and um, everyone have a lovely evening um, and take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Anna. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anna. Thanks oh. for having us. <laughs> Bye.